all right we are here for the live stream that's happening the developer update live stream on april 20th it starts in about a minute and then they're playing the trailer right now and i believe there's like fifteen thousand. In order to get these shards oh 16,000 almost 17,000 people watching to here and then on YouTube is about 10,000 better be prepared to fight if you're going to be playing any no everyone's pretty hype I'm pretty hype I can't wait to watch man. in the meantime I'm not live streaming or restreaming or co-streaming this right now um, I'm just watching this offline and I'm just recording so hopefully you guys enjoyed the reaction it's what it's 10 59 right now a.m pacific standard time daily daylight time i don't know man but this thing's will be nine minutes long and there's some secret announcements and there's more stuff i'm gonna increase the volume though on my side it's really just going to be a way to keep coming back and experiencing more Diablo 4 in fresh ways. We're really eager to hear. All right, it is 11. So I'm assuming they're starting after this trailer is done. With you all. We already know this. They already, this is the Into the End Game trailer. Oh, okay, never mind. Just skipped into this. Oh, no, no, no. That's part of it. Okay. <laughs> Silly me. Oh, here we go. Hey folks, this is Riker, and welcome to the next Diablo 4 developer live stream update. I'll be your co-host. I'm a YouTube content creator and professional Diablo fan. And I want to thank the Diablo team for having me here today. We're going to be uh, diving into some he juicy some, topics. He has some papers and, uh, here. And we have with us some folks who'll... That's probably the timeline. We have with us. Hi, I'm Joe Shelley. I'm the game director for Diablo 4. And <clears throat> for folks watching us uh, here and keep an eye on chat, please keep an eye on the cameras. They start spinning end over end. You know, we had a bad problem and we're not going to space today. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Okay, I'm Joseph Pipora. I'm yeah, there's, there's volume this Diablo time, right? 4. I remember they, uh, when they switched Adam cameras, Fletcher, the associate director of uh, it was, uh, it was there was no the sound Diablo on franchise. like YouTube or something. Um, or just no so sound. We have a lot to talk about today. We have Riker here. Thank you again, Riker, for joining us uh, to be our, our uh, host uh, for this actual live stream itself. And um, we did want to actually do a few quick agenda items and so forth beforehand. Um, just a reminder to everyone that Diablo 4 obviously is coming out in June is and it? you can still pre-order. Yeah. Um, uh, we do have uh, deluxe and ultimate versions available for pre-order or you can pre-order the, just the base game itself. But the deluxe and ultimate versions actually give you early access. So uh, there should be a QR code on screen if you want to pre-order for deluxe or ultimate versions of the game. Today though, we have a ton to talk about. Um, we expect this minutes. stream to be about 90 minutes or so because uh, we oh, want to cover tweet a lot of different topics. One being end game, uh, the started. other one being some class balance uh, changes in regards to uh, so they're gonna go over the uh, feedback the stuff feedback first, that we right? ended up okay. receiving, yep. uh, as well as the dungeon feedback that we also received during uh, our beta learnings uh, that we actually posted last week. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna stay quiet for most of the stream. You'll see me more towards the end. But I will <laughs> like with the I secret announcement off no. to uh, right I'll to kind be, of start. I'll be on Twitter the whole time. He's very busy. Yes, I'm okay. looking at chat. Yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> I'll be looking at chat because we will be doing Q and A afterwards. True. Uh, but I, I will Ooh, pass it off to Riker because obviously, uh, Riker, you've had uh, uh, quite a journey in getting down here, and of course, uh, over the past week, you've been able to play uh, the latest builds of uh, Diablo oh, Four, and we'd love to build. get your take and uh, kind of hear like how was it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So I've been waiting for Diablo 4 for since years before it was ever revealed. I've been waiting so long, I'm literally transforming into Deckard King. I mean, look <laughs> at me. So, yeah, when you reached out for, uh, for, for the chance to come to the offices, play the latest build, uh, yeah. then getting to come here, getting to experience it, getting to uh, talk to some awesome people who gave me awesome insight into the build, into the systems, and get to play with decked out characters, end game builds, seeing all decked the synergies out. coming together with the items, the Paragon boards and everything. It's really been a blast. Awesome, good to hear. Um, I know one of the first topics that we wanted to jump into was, uh, I believe it was like like some, talking a little bit more about the, the World Tears and the Capstone Dungeons, I believe. Yeah, because that's basically the, I guess the gateway into all the other topics, right? Because we have the World Tier system is like the yeah. different difficulties and the Capstone and Dungeons like the base. how you unlock those and then get access to all that end game stuff. So I think we have some footage to show while, uh, Joe, you want to talk? Us yeah, through? let's talk yeah. about this. So right. yeah, the, I guess Drew the first it. thing we want to talk about here is when players are going through the base game experience, they're finishing the campaign, they reach level 50, they get to move into their first uh, World Tier content, which is the Nightmare Tier. 
before they gain access to that, they actually are going to have to go through what we call one of our end cap dungeons. These are longer and more challenging Absolutely. dungeon spaces that have big like boss encounters mixed throughout. And uh, you can do it in team, like, right? Milestones where players are expected to pass in order to gain access uh, to that. Or is it like team. Genshin now, where they have to uh, solo? Uh, Riker, when you were playing, you had a chance to actually uh, check out your first uh, end cap dungeon, or at least as part of this test. Like, what was your what was your experience playing through this? Yeah, so the first end cap dungeon. All right. <laughs> I was one yeah, of those guys who was saying veteran difficulty is too easy, crank it up. So end cap dungeon, I think the first one, it's recommended level 50. I was level 45, thought I was a hot shot, went in there. It was a humbling experience. <laughs> That's how I, I discovered that, yeah, if you die enough times, you got to go back to town to repair your gear. So hardcore oh, players but... beware. Uh, I had to learn like boss mechanics, study, adjust my build, and eventually put my tail between my legs, go power up a bit more before trying it again. But then conquering it felt like a really great achievement. Very satisfying. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, okay. these aren't really spaces we expect players to want to go and like try to farm and try to get a lot of things out of. It's more these are again, these are milestones, gates for players to pass in order to gain access to that nightmare tier. Once the players actually mm. get into uh, okay. their their this next world tier, world tier three, they're gaining access to a few new features. We're gonna talk about a number of them today. So you'll you'll start to see that uh, areas of the world are gonna be affected by the, the hell tide system. You're gonna gain access to nightmare dungeons. Uh, you're going to start to see unique items uh, begin to drop in different parts of the game. Sacred. And then you're going to start to see sacred and ancestral items also begin to appear in World Tiers 3, and then in particularly in 4. Uh, and also, in addition mm. to those things, the, the world, of course, is becoming more dangerous as the players step into uh, Nightmares and uh, Torment Tiers, World Tiers 3 and 4, respectively. Monsters can do more damage. Uh, they are going to be more aggressive. Um, uh, there's a number of changes. Maybe. Joe, do you have any, any thoughts on like the uh, like some of the changes that we made to monsters in World Tears? Yeah. You know, one of the things I love about the capstone <clears throat> dungeons functioning as unlocks for the World Tears is yeah. that Can you've got this, uh, this ge the general gameplay loop of getting more powerful, optimizing your build, getting more gear, and then you have something that you're testing yourself against. And then when you defeat that, you move thing, into though? this entirely That's... new world tier with all mm. of the uh, additional like systems and mechanics uh, and features that unlock. So you, you're really moving into a place where new stuff is happening. You're unlocking new cool stuff. Yeah, enemies are more aggressive, they're more accurate, they're faster, they're moving more quickly. You start to deal with, uh, with uh, champion uh, creatures, which are just more powerful than minions, can show up in your uh, elites and be affected in certain ways. That's right, like, yeah. The, mm. uh, the uh, monsters... Um, have you know certain cooldowns between their attacks? They have um, logic for how oh. they do targeting. Um, they have uh, projectiles. Have some projectiles have seeking, True, yeah. uh, so they can oh. home to some extent. Um, and um, they have some logic about how they group up and how they decide which which people to target. And so a lot of those different parameters people target you adjust okay. as you go up in world tier to make the monsters more threatening. Because of course the players oh, are getting the AI more, gets uh, more complicated. That's the game, good. That's good. Skilled. So even if you see the same monster, it'll probably act differently. Uh, new abilities through uh, uh, legendary powers or uh, even unique items. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things we wanted to make sure we didn't do too much is it's, it's easy for us to imagine that we could just make the game more difficult by increasing the damage the creatures deal or increasing the amount of hit points they have as you're going through these encounters. But we wanted to make sure that the, just the world felt more dangerous as you progress into these higher world tiers. And that requires more, uh, more work when working with monsters and those, uh, those various encounters to kind of like create mm. that extra level of challenge. Like uh, did environment, you kind of environmental determine sense anything like kind of going from world tiers like one and two into like world tiers three or four? Oh, I definitely felt it. I, you stated in the difficulty descriptions. I guess I just glossed over it, and I just expected more damage, more health. Yeah, I know how difficulty works, <laughs> but the, I was starting to feel oh, the world just seems more hostile, more aggressive, and that's when I realized oh, there's a lot more at play in the increased difficulty here than just bigger numbers. Which right. Is nice. There's one more thing I want to talk about with regard to World Tears as well. And this is the, I'm very excited about this talk in general. I've been waiting to have a lot of these conversations uh, and with the audience so they can kind of convey some of the, uh, the, the more interesting depth and complexities associated and with the And the logical systems. reasoning. Uh, so in World Tears, we gave, you, you gain access to uh, a new, two, two new sets of itemization tiers. In World Tier 3, you gain access to sacred items that may appear for you. And in World Tier 4, you gain access to ancestral items that can be the drop for players as they're going through those spaces. Now, with the players leveling up from 1 to 50, the items that you're getting from monsters that you're killing are going to be, are, the power is going to be based on their, their strength and level. So if you are, you know, you're playing in uh, the beta and you're killing level, you know, 35 monsters for whatever reason, and you're going to be getting slightly more powerful gear as a result of that because the monsters are more challenging and they're going to be dropping better gear for you. 
But once you have reached right, level 50, right. and, that, and that basically that flow means that as you're leveling up and you're fighting more challenging things, you're going to continue to like slowly upgrade all of your gear over time. You'll find a ring here, and a helmet there, a pair of gloves. That's great. That's how we want you to kind of like get exposed to itemization systems as you're progressing through initially in the game. But once you get into World Tier 3, things change a little bit. So items that drop, you have a chance to be sacred. Not every item in World Tier 3 is sacred by default. So the higher the level of the creature that you're fighting, the more likely the chances that items drop from that creature will be sacred in nature, or also based on the kind of content you're completing. But sacred items, when they drop, right. can actually they drop dropping. a very large range in terms of the power that they can, uh, they can have. So you could get into World Tier 3, you could kill a pack of elites in your first dungeon in World Tier 3 at level 50. And you can get an item out of, out of that group, maybe it's a rare, you know, uh, rare item that drops up in that group that is you know, powerful enough that it could serve a level 70 character. The sacred item tier basically is going to have gear in it that goes from level 50 all the way up to level 70 in terms of like the, the power swing there. Damn. Uh, okay. Once you get a little bit higher, it's a little more likely to get slightly higher in the range, but it's very likely you can get those really, really great drops really early, which we think is super exciting. We want you to be trying to like always be looking for like just the right ring, and it could show up like your best in slot ring for that uh, for a sacred tier might show up at level 51. And that might be the one hmm. you want to hold on to for the entirety of that tier. And you're you're talking about <clears throat> when, when you're talking about these sacred items, the level requirement for this ring, for example, is not seventy, right? No, no, no. So the level that's a great point, Joe. It's so 50, the level requirement right? for this is actually to be set at the level at which you actually loot the item. So once again, oh, I see. you have trading in the game. If you are level fifty and you get a really, really great ring drop, that's gonna be good for not quite your build, but like maybe, you know, maybe you're playing a, a bleed barbarian, this is really, really good for like a berserk build or like a big fury build. You know, and you say, okay, I'm gonna I wanna give this to you, you can hold on to it, that could be a really valuable item of trade. Because it could be that it's it's like it's it's eye power is such that it's like really good for a level seventy character, but the uh, the required level for the uh, for the ring itself is level fifty because you've got it at level fifty. And that's gonna raise Oh, you got it at fifty. I think that's gonna be okay. super fun for players to chase. And there's more of that as you get into the ancestral tier, but, but that's not all. I think the next thing we're talking about is actually uh, legendary and unique items. Oh, okay. I want so, to pause and right. read this, but uh, we've talked we'll a little see. bit about legendary items in the past. You know, I I really want to focus on trample. I want this one. Time to trample. To a general overview. You know, legendary items in general are attached to like legendary powers, and these legendary powors are <laughs> reverse. Legendary powers are attached <laughs> to legendary items. Uh, legendary powers uh, basically are designed to uh, appear on multiple different slots. So, you know, an, an aspect might appear on amulet, but it might also appear on gloves, or it might appear on ring, or it might, be, uh, might also appear on weapons. These things right. have a tendency to be in a lot of different places based on the power itself. And we like this because it lets players like, extract aspects and powers from items and put them into other items that, that, that meet the, our certain uh, criteria. It's fun because we want players to go and be chasing certain fantasies. It helps them kind of like hone in on certain kinds of builds and gets them excited about the potential of like kind of taking all these different Legos and kind of putting them together. Can I say Legos on stream? Uh, oh, yes. Legendaries, <laughs> yeah. Legend, yeah, legendaries <laughs> is what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> yeah, so when, you, when you get all of these legendaries <laughs> together uh, and you put them together, that's going to be really, really fun. So that's that's part of the fantasy we think of uh, a legendary item. Uh, you, you actually get a chance when you're going to one of fifty. There's only a certain number of these that are actually available. But when you get Legends. into uh, world tiers three and four, more legendary powers are available. Did you get a chance to see any like new legendary powers as you were playing? Oh yeah, I mean I definitely got to see a, a variety of legendary powers. I got a certain number of drops. Drop rates didn't feel out of control, uh, but you know you guys gave me some pre-made characters as well that were decked out with builds, and I saw lots of cool synergistic powers that came together to really. Um, yeah, I want that trample. Well, and some I think my favorite power was probably on a actually a unique item. The thing is that it summons the, last light pillars for the druid. Druid that made your werewolf form your true form. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of yep. people have been saying, "Hey, can I just be a werewolf all the time?" There's also yep. a werebear one, right? Yes, <laughs> yes you can. <laughs> yeah, that's the next step, right? So you so unique items. So unique items only begin to appear when players enter the uh, the nightmare tier. So once you're in World right. Tier 3, there's a low chance that some of the uh, the uh, game's unique items will begin to appear for players as they're progressing through the, uh, this experience. And they're very, very rare. Now, these more. are huge chase items and opportunities here. Some yeah, of them are really very important. Rare. Making some open up a whole whole different build paths and opportunities for players to go and pursue. These are things that are designed to be really exciting. Like what you suggest there when you had that experience trying to gather the uh, the werewolf, you know, uh, you know, the, the ability to stay in werewolf form effectively forever uh, with the uh, for that uh, with that druid unique. Uh, really, really cool stuff. Um, and there's more of these unlocked over the course of your level progression as well. You know, I think I saw Shaco earlier there in uh, the list of unique items. That's correct. Uh, Shaco does make a return, and there's lots of opportunities for this us to basically other, kind of pay right? homage to, uh, to <laughs> the items that came in previous versions of Diablo, previous entries in the series. 
uh, you'll see a number of different items make returns. Uh, items like grandfather, Shaco, obviously. Mm. You'll see a few, a few familiar, and then a few familiar favorites, and then more over the course of the game's wide development. Also, this more is, do uh, all a skills. Good way for people to kind of see the new, uh, <laughs> the new uh, font changes and so forth that oh, yeah. uh, based off the, oh, yeah. the data learnings that, uh, that that we actually ended up posting uh, yeah. last week. Yeah, we'll get more into the beta learnings later in the live stream. We'll, we'll go over them in a lot more depth. But uh, yeah, absolutely, the font was a great example. I mean, I think uh, <coughs> we added we added at least twenty percent more serifs to the twenty percent more serifs. Um, serif, yeah. But no, seriously, people pointed out that the font, um, while highly readable, and we spent a lot of time thinking about you know how the game is going to display on all kinds of different screens, uh, different aspect ratios. Um, mm -hmm. TVs, right? And so we want the font to be highly readable. At I wish all I could zoom in on the papers that they had. Um, like, uh, but uh, it didn't feel as much like Diablo as it could have. And so we went back and looked for a font that was still highly readable, but had uh, more of a Diablo thing. And, you know, it's just a great example of, um, you know, players pointing something out and, and us being able to, to react to it. All right, what's next? What's the, uh, the next thing we want to talk about, Micah? What do you think? Uh, well, so we have all these legendary items. One semi-deterministic way to farm for them, Helltide. It's mm. an activity where, well, I guess you can dive into how exactly you can target farm specific item slots to hunt for specific unique items. Um, and it's going to be one of the main end game activities that we'll be partaking in, right? Yeah, absolutely. So right. as I mentioned before, once the player gains access to Nightmare Torment here, uh, they are going to or, uh, Nightmare tier. They're going to start getting act, They're going to start seeing some of these new activities. One of them, which is Helltide. Uh, Helltide is basically going to be uh, the switch where you you know you're running What's into the uh, world of sanctuary. Thing that you know, oh, sky Helltide duration. Red, blood begins to fall from the sky. New monsters begin to appear. Everything is more challenging. New like events are going to start showing up. And, and importantly, as you're killing, oh, you don't see the HP bar in one of these Helltide areas. You're going to be getting what we call cinders. It's this new currency players are able to collect while they're specifically within these spaces. Oh, that's the number of cinders and this is that you great have. You get to take these cinders, and as you're wandering through the overworld, you might be running on your other players. Uh, you might you be find these chest like flesh flesh like chests. Right? Uh, you'll be looking for these Helltide caches mm -hmm. you can see here. And these are great. So you're pointing about being able to target farm for certain kinds of items. So every one of the caches in the Helltide zone is actually tied to an item slot. And they all have different costs. So you look kind of like you'll be gathering cinders by playing within the space, trying to locate one of the caches that have the item type that you're looking for. Whether like maybe you're looking for an amulet or looking for a ring, you know, maybe you're looking, maybe you're looking for a shako. So you're looking actually to go find a helmet cache and want to keep trying to go after the helmet cache and yeah. the rare desperate hope that you're going to get exactly the unique item that you're looking for. Right? That's cool. We want to give you some of that opportunity to give you that opportunity to target farm a little bit. But there's actually a little bit of fun there too. Uh, so one of the, the things that's one of my personal favorite parts of the Helltide system is the idea that the uh, the player is, the players uh, there's like an extra set of stakes right when the players run around with these cinders uh, they have the chance if they if they die they're going to lose about half their cinders every time they, they they fall and they don't they don't drop on the ground they're gone so you have to be very careful about like when you're looking to overextend as part of the combat experience in order to like farm more risk, cinders oh uh, risk the or take you're looking for whatever that is you are putting yourself at more risk the more you try to like gather and the greeter you get the more likely it is that you're going to lose things that's right and there's a, a time limit on helltide too right that's right helltide yeah. is only active like the, the the force of hell only like arrive for about like about an hour uh during uh when they are uh, actually active and different areas of sanctuary are picked for uh for helltide zone each time it rotates and moves around so you need to make good use of your uh your power and you if you leave a helltide zone those cinders are gone you have to you have to spend them so if you oh. see the clock is ticking down you're getting, five or four or three minutes away from the end of the hell tide, you've got to find yourself a cache to kind of deposit those things. Yeah, absolutely. My experience, okay. I first jumped into a hell tide event with, I think, 23 minutes left on the clock. So I start by, okay, I'm scouting out the different uh, chests or, or caches mm. uh, to set, to see, okay, which is the one that has the, the, the slot that I'm looking for, what are the different costs, and then I'm doing some quick math. Okay, I'm gathering cinders at about this rate per minute. I have this many minutes left. Okay, I think I could afford the, the most expensive, the weapon slot, and I got weapon. to backtrack to that place in order to get there. And then I died. And I'm like, okay, recalculating. Yeah. Uh, okay, how much time do I have left now? And okay, like, okay, yeah, so, so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I died again. I'm like, better luck next time. Well, another hour before the next one comes around. <laughs> I'll have a better plan. Every hour? Now, granted, you can still get legendary items dropped for you. You can still get really good drops inside Helltide experience even while you're killing monsters. So it's not like if you lose those sinners, you've lost all options. Which is better, but right? Obviously, it does take a little wind out of your sails if you just happen to get jumped at the wrong time. Again, another great opportunity for there to be players nearby when they're trying to help, uh, help out in those yeah. situations. 
Yeah, you know, one of the things I think is really cool about this is that the, so the, these uh, shafts or caches, boxes with loot, in, awesome loot inside, mm. right? Good um, group content they, too, huh? Uh, you know, each time a Helltide appears, they appear, they are in different locations, That's right? right? So yeah. you you have to go and find them, uh, you know, as Breiker was saying. Um, <clears throat> but within for the duration of that Helltide, they're in fixed places. So oh. you know, when you go into the Helltide area, it's useful to scout out and see where the caches are for the item spots that you're interested in. Um, and then you can, you know, mentally remember, okay, here, I want to farm around here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back here. I'm going to get this this item or, or whatever. Wait, fix one thing I want to call out here, um, you know, you, you saw one of the... So once you know where the, the, the helmet one is, there, you, you know, go... In, in some of our video that we captured for it. Mm -hmm. Now, we did capture that with the, uh, with the UI off, mm -hmm. so you can't see the, the mm -hmm. icon above it, but there is an icon that says, in here there are boots. That's correct, So you yeah. will know before you open that cache uh, what's in it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, that's not okay. all. I mean, there's, uh, there's other risks and dangers inherent in Helltide areas. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity for you to fight some, like, some different bosses. Again, like I mentioned before, there are different events and things that actually are going to be showing up. Uh, and, uh, of course, we, we can't really have such a, such a, a wonderful experience as Helltide without our baby boy, the Butcher, showing up occasionally and causing serious uh, mayhem and mischief. Uh, in the uh, the overworld of sanctuary, so lots of really fun overworld, things not just dungeons. Of course, of the player's experience, and it's also an opportunity to farm a special crafting material, right? Uh, that's correct. There are craft materials like fiend rows and things that really are coming directly from hell tide encounters and those experiences. So you are looking okay. to also get some of the materials you need for like really high tier uh, like weapon and item upgrades from going through these uh, these places. So hell tide is what we're doing to farm. Uh, crafting materials in order to target farm specific drops. Another big activity that we're going to be doing, Nightmare Dungeons. You want to talk a bit about that? Yeah. So, yeah, Joe, do you have anything you want to talk about for Nightmare yeah, Dungeons so, first? Yeah, so, you know, Nightmare Dungeons are, we, we're we going to talk uh, again, we're going to talk about oh, the uh, feedback at the end of the, the, the show. Um, or near, near the end of the show. Cooldowns on so. kills. That's a good uh, thing, right? Dungeons are our key. Also, those green things are a good thing for the later part of the game, right? Um, and you're going to get sigils, and Joe's going to talk a little bit about the sigils. Tier three, seventeen, twenty-nine. We're really 29. excited for players to get to check out all of the cool ways that the dungeons can really be transformed uh, by the Nightmare Dungeon system. Yeah. So, uh, so first up, Nightmare Dungeons, very, very exciting system. Players get, haven't had a chance to play these in our betas yet, but as they get into the uh, the, uh, the end game content, start mm -hmm. going through World Tiers three and four. You'll begin to see uh, you'll gain access to some of your first sigils, which are primarily initially earned by completing Whispers of the Dead, one of our other overworld content uh, features that players are able to engage with. Now, uh, sigils that, are really interesting that in that they are tied to a, a level when you find them, which is going to affect the, uh, the level of the monsters inside that space. Uh, they have various afflictions. Oh. We've talked, talked a little bit uh, about in streams in the past. Uh, these are going to modify the way that, that that level rolls out. But Nightmare Sigils, when they are activated, when you after you collect one, is going to basically open up a portal near an existing side dungeon. And uh, with every, in the pre-release version of Diablo 4 and additional seasons, that part of the dungeon, the, the thing that's floating around? Of all of the side dungeons of the game that can Oh, you have to go in there for a shield. Period. So players will oh. become, uh, become more familiar with a set number of these because they know that they can be populated with these Nightmare Dungeon experiences. So you might already know, whether it's Annex Claim or whatever it is, what the, lay uh, what the layout of a given dungeon might look like normally. But Nightmare, uh, Nightmare Sigil is gonna change that by introducing these new afflictions and then also these greater Oof. afflictions. Uh, we showed uh, earlier in the video, like this. Uh, right now, actually, we're looking at a uh, this this uh, uh, this hell portal, a uh, nightmare portal that can open up and basically spawn in all these monsters uh, from other like monster families that might not be native to that dungeon, which is pretty cool. In that we like we like the idea that players are going to have to kind of legendary deal with right new there. different threats than what they're typically used to as part as part of that encounter. And there's a number of these other like greater afflictions, like we showed the. Uh, uh, Stormbane's wrath, that like that disc thing that's flowing around behind uh, yeah. around you okay. occasionally just pulses out this really big stunning damaging effect. So you have to be mindful of where it is and sure make sure you avoid it as part of the combat experience. Definitely adds a new wrinkle to gameplay as you're going through. And we add Wait, did it summon an AoE or did it summon a barrier? Up and get a barrier right? Deeper and deeper into the uh, the nightmare sigil system, uh, get it unlocking higher level sigils and dealing with like uh, more and more dangerous threats over the course of time. And this is a this is a really great place. Not only just to, uh, to like earn experience and really push your build and make sure that you're uh, you're strong at tackling these sorts of challenges, but you'll also be able. to, These are really great places to farm for like sacred and ancestral items in particular, and uh, these are the places that you're going to be upgrading your paragon glyphs. Mm. Which we talked more about the paragons. Oh, right upgrade now. them. So, and <laughs> <laughs> that like this is an opportunity to show the actual upgrade glyph screen. I just noticed like, hey, look, it's actually up right now. What what timing? Um, 
So, yeah, when the player reaches the end of a Nightmare Dungeon, they get to basically go ahead and take one of the glyphs they've been collecting over the course of their 50-plus uh, their experience and basically uh, slot into here and choose to upgrade it and make that glyph even more powerful. These Soxables will go in your Paragon board and end up like being EXP. some of the single most powerful modifiers you can apply to your character above legendary powers and even in some cases even above some unique powers. So it's really in your benefit based on your hmm. build to be choosing, uh, looking for a set number of these and upgrade them to exactly what you need them to do. Do you sacrifice the, the uh, it looks like you sacrifice the, the other ones getting. to alkylate uh, EXP? What I noticed is that if you get some afflictions that you don't particularly care about, we have the ability to salvage some in order to craft sigils of our own, right? I think it's a four to one ratio, is that right? Yeah, just about. So it, you'll okay. be able to get mm -hmm. a lot of these different sigils by going through Nightmare Dungeons, completing Whispers, and other, uh, through other content. And if you're finding sigils that you don't really want or don't really want to run, because maybe it's going to have, like, enemies inside are going to do additional lightning damage, but you don't have a lot of lightning resist on your build. Maybe you want to go ahead and like salvage that back at the Occultist. Take that down to its sigil dust and use that to basically make new random sigils for you to go ahead and run with. This is ways for players to kind of like, you know, push themselves a little further. Mm. They'll unlock higher level sigils they can craft through, uh, through the system over the course of time. And uh, just uh, it's one. a way to kind of like reutilize some of the sigils you might not be as interested in running from time to time. You know, one thing I liked about the afflictions was it was making me make choices during the gameplay. Uh, like two that I can speak to, the, the nightmare gates that we were just showcasing. Let's say I'm in the middle of fighting an elite and I'm almost taking him down. I see that nightmare portal opening and I'm like, okay, should I take care of that before it starts spawning more monsters or do I finish this fight first? I'm forced to make a decision mm -hmm. and I got to live with the consequences <laughs> if I think, you know, maybe I should take him down and then, no, the fight becomes more challenging and, nope, I should have taken care of that gate first. Another one is, I forget the name, but it's it's some kind of blood cyst that starts to grow, 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 mm -hmm. and then if blood you just don't touch it, it eventually explodes oh. in a huge area. Yeah. And it's either, okay, destroy it before it does that or get the heck away as fast <laughs> as possible. Again, um, making choices and it's like okay I think I, I had I thought I had time to get away then I got crowd controlled and then boom one shot so I, I like how it changes the dungeon experience depending on which of these afflictions that you you get yeah absolutely and there's death counts in some of these as well as time goes on you get into the deeper ones where you gotta be careful you can't choose to just throw yourself at these things and if you're making mistakes you have to really evaluate carefully how you're progressing yeah okay, yeah hmm that's true so, so yeah, you've got a chance to play through some of those. Uh, so yeah, Nightmare Dungeon is very exciting. And they'll go up beyond level 100 as well. Actually, oh, wow. so uh, this, is, this is a content type that you can actually fight up to creatures up to level 150, actually, as part of the experience, based on how, how far you're able to push yourself as time goes on. So I'm really excited about how, how far <laughs> players can go with that. All right, now you're talking about glyphs and the Paragon system. So let's talk more about those Paragon boards. Oh, oh. let's do it. Okay, Paragon boards. So we've, uh, we've talked a bit about Paragon in the past. You know, we've shown pictures of the board just like this, and we've shown you things like, hey, look, like here's normal node. This is a way that you're going to earn like five willpower. You know, uh, but that's not all this board is about. Five you know, willpower. There's a lot of other uh, there's a lot of other complexity and things to deal with in here. Crackling so energy damage of to kind of like quickly uh, reprise some of this information. Uh, the first, of course, is normal nodes. Then we have what we show here is magic nodes. These are different affixes that you can collect over the course of time. Usually, they're like a little bit more difficult to find a direct like version of mm. on items. So, like something like this, for example, crackling energy uh, damage. So there's a so that's a that's a a sorceress of like a lightning uh, lightning spec sorceress yeah. uh, ability or uh, passive effectively, where uh, she'll occasionally be crackling out damage to uh, to nearby uh, targets. You can now boost that by finding this particular magic node, which kind of might uh, eventually unlock other builds for you to kind of go and chase after. But then there are rare nodes, which is on the next slide. And uh, here, okay, so there's a, some information here. And then bonus. Uh, rare nodes have a pretty powerful effect right off the bat. You know, and, but then on top of that, there's this, this bonus effect down below that you can, you can sort of see. Where uh, on this one, it is, yeah, another 60% damage to elites. If you reach a certain amount of dexterity for your character. Mm -hmm. So the point here is that like, rare nodes on their own, of which there's about 10 or more per, uh, per board, rare nodes are already pretty powerful generically. But then on top of that, and if you were able to really? hit these thresholds for the uh, stat requirements... Is there more that was in the nodes, data mine? That is going to make them very, very potent. Or Druid, I think there was like, some of them were like the board, four these or are some of the most, like six. The most critical things you'd be thinking about when you're plotting your path through each board, which you, of course, there are you know, a number of boards rare you to launch. And then when you'll be able to rotate them, you'll have to choose how you want to progress through hmm. rare nodes, whether you want to engage with the legendary nodes or not. This is a really important thing. Yeah. One, other, one other bit about this, just because I, I, it's easy for me to forget about, is that... When you're going from Paragon board to Paragon board, like in the first board, this might be the cost. But then when you're looking at the second board that, uh, that you're progressing through, those requirements are actually going to go up. 
So it's not in your interest to go like run from board to board, just unlock as many of these as you can directly that way. You need oh, really? to spend a little bit of time into the board and pick the ones that you really want because the next board that you unlock to get more rare nodes of, of different types, it would be a little more expensive to unlock those bonus effects. The thing I think is really interesting about mm. this is when I, so you the, pick the way that order I, order right, when I open a Paragon board, the first thing I do is go and look at the rare, the nearest rare nodes to me, mm. to, to my That's why I did. starting, right? <clears throat> And then I see, I look at the, and the, the, the requirements legendary. for those bonuses, and then I start looking at the normal nodes on the way. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you didn't I'm have the requirements, the though, on the, the build calculator here. thing. Um, are there some dexterity nodes that I could hit on the way here that would take me over it? And, you know, how much do I care about that particular bonus? And then I'm, you know, comparing it to the other ones, and I'm thinking about that. So the, the normal nodes actually become sort of a path that you're trying to take to turn on these bonuses. Absolutely. And that's not all. Having a good foundation is probably well, good. And then we're going to get back to normal nodes in just a second. So then we have our legendary nodes. So every one of the boards for each of the classes has a legendary node somewhere on it. And these are really, really powerful uh, powers like you'd expect. They are a legendary power, effectively unique to the Paragon board system bonus. for that class and for the whatever the, that particular board is trying for to do. For 20 intelligence you have. So mm -hmm. these are really, really powerful things to go and collect. But they're actually not the most powerful thing. This is just an additional extra powerful app because you can kind of apply to your character, but you kind of do this in concert with other things that you're looking for. Like I mentioned, the rare Yeah, notes. I think the rare ones and are- I also talked to you about glyphs, mm -hmm. and we're gonna talk about that next. So when you, basically, as you're glyphs. going to the board, there are gonna be these sockets that you can unlock. And the sockets are gonna be sitting adjacent to a number of other regular nodes. Now, the way that glyphs work is that you're going to put them into one of these sockets, and they are going to be affecting nearby nodes and also fueled by other nearby nodes. So if you hit Feel, certain thresholds inside uh, some of the glyphs, you're also going to unlock powerful bonuses. They're going to other always uh, also it's affect on no uh, nearby nodes at the same time. And as I mentioned before, glyphs can be leveled up pretty high. They continue to grow the radius of the affected nodes as you level up through certain tiers. Ten so percent uh, affect larger and larger. Four areas. seconds after casting. And the boards are not symmetrical in nature as you're progressing through, because the player can rotate their board and choose which gate they actually want to uh, to uh, enter from. Uh, you you have to like kind of choose from board to board. Which, where are the sockets on this board? Are they near the stats I really want for this glyph? Because, you know, this glyph is going to be fueled by, yeah. you know, dexterity it's... nodes within range of the glyph, uh, glyph effect. And it's going to do additional like, critical strike damage, whatever it's going to do for me as a result. Uh, that's a really, really important choice to make. And because all the boards have different configurations, different socket locations, and different things near those sockets, you have a lot of interesting decisions to make about, like, where you actually want to... There's only, like, one and socket of board, how right? Matter, like, how does it feel to do this relative to the rare nodes you might need on that board from, uh, from a different board instead? Like fun decisions for players to make as they're going through. We want we want ultimately to feel like the Paragon system allows for like two, you know, incinerate, focus, burn type sorceresses to feel like they've got very different paths to the Paragon board, different decisions to make, even if all of their skill choices are identical. Yeah, it's something that you know we talk about a lot with Diablo Four is the idea that even if you have, uh, you know, let's say incinerate is a powerful sorcerer build uh, for, you know. Um, and, and you want to play Incinerate, mm -hmm. you're not going to necessarily be the same, uh, have exactly the same uh, loadout as another Incinerate sorcerer. That's right. One thing I found really cool about the Paragon system that I, I didn't realize at first is that the, every Paragon board is almost like a Paragon class, like a specialization class where it's all built around a certain theme, fantasy, play style, um, right. And it all revolves around that that central or off central legendary node, and then the the, the rares kind of support that same theme, and it extends to the blues. So like on a necromancer, like oh this board is like the pure summoner uh, fantasy, and this one is the, the 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 blood mage. And looking at it that way, it really like made it uh, very cool yeah. for me to be able to explore. Okay, you know I can merge these two together. I'm gonna go like bone and and blood, and just further. Uh, yeah, explore and, and dive into that that specialization. Yeah. You know, there's uh, 220 Paragon points that players will be able to have by the time they finish leveling up their character at level 100. Uh, we want those choices to feel like they've got meaning individually. Players can, uh, can respect a number of those choices if they want for gold cost. Uh, we want to be able to play with this system and be able to like, kind of experiment with different ideas as they go. But importantly, we want them to feel like that the choices they made for the 220 matter a great deal for their overall performance. Yeah. Yeah, super fun. I think, you know, but, you know. What are we talking about next? Well, I guess uh, at this point we can talk about some of the, the beta learnings. We had, uh, mm, we had a beta, right. the community gave a lot of feedback, and uh, you folks took in that feedback, digested it, and transformed it into uh, actionable change in the game. You wanna talk to some of the things that were changed? 
Yeah, I think I'll load up the, talk the about notes. That. Now is the time. Um, so let's start out with looking at some of the class changes that we did. Mm. Um, so yeah. there's a lot of text on this screen. Uh, you've had an opportunity, if you've been following along, to check out our, our blog that documents a lot of the changes um, that uh, we, we were able to make as a result of uh, uh, feedback from players. There are 24,000 uh, people right now. Weekend. And also um, from uh, data that we get. You know, we, we get a lot of data, um, you know, uh, how many times someone dies in a, you know, our necromancers dying a lot in this dungeon or is this boss killing barbarians a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And we can use that uh, alongside player data to identify areas where there might be a uh, class deficiency or um, areas where maybe something is ex exceptionally strong uh, compared to other things that are uh, balanced to be the same, the same power. Um, and so in general, one of the things that we looked at from, uh, mm. from those two beta weekends is we need uh, more on the, the legendary stuff. The druid, the melee classes felt uh, weaker than the, the necromancer, rogue, and sorcerer. Right. Um, and there are a lot of aspects to that. So there's some nuancing here, right? Like for the barbarian, we felt, uh, we identified that uh, the barbarian um, at low levels in particular um, needed damage. more damage reduction sort of built in. Um, and so we added this passive damage reduction. So you just, you're just going to take 10% less damage. Okay, so they, flat, they rebalanced that part. Making, um, they took some of the stuff there. Account for um, some of the ways the barbarian has to get up and close, mm -hmm. up close and personal with their sort of weapon heavy uh, spec. Um, we also identified uh, elements of the druid that uh, uh, you could could really benefit from some buffs. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Riker, you got to play the druid a little bit. Yeah. I did, yeah. So honestly, when I first saw the the patch notes, I was like, oh, I was hoping the druid would have gotten a bit more love with regards to um, spirit generation. Mm -hmm. But then I played an endgame build of you get a lot a, of spirit. A perma werewolf storm druid. So I'm a werewolf who's casting uh, you know storm skills, and it, the play style was so tight. It flowed so well. Uh, it just all gelled together once you got the full kit, the full the full storm wear bear. And I went into this week with a certain class favoritism. Where I had rogue, I had a necromancer. Sorceress, um, Barbarian, and then Druid in dead last. I'm completely confused now. I think Druid might be my favorite now. <laughs> yeah, it's, Storm, you know, another thing that we did, if we take a look at the, the classes again, another thing that we did in terms of I the I want to try the Earth skill, though. Um, is we took a look at uh, bosses and monsters, uh, in particular their attacks that uh, deal damage in an area uh, where it feels like there wasn't a way for the melee class to deal damage effectively while also uh, avoiding, uh, avoiding incoming damage, right? Because a lot of times you'll have the opportunity for uh, a ranged class to, the ranged class is sometimes choosing between getting a better position and, and doing more damage, or you know, damage per second. Yeah. And a yeah. melee class is sometimes choosing between taking, taking damage, um, you know, because uh, even with the case of a projectile, the projectile is originating in many cases from the, the, the monster and then traveling. So you, know, have, you have less time to react in some cases. Um, and so we took a look at, at uh, boss uh, abilities and, oh, and that bosses spider. That, for, that our data showed. <laughs> the spider always just runs away. He shoots some stuff and runs away. Now, this also affects the necromancer class um, because you might no notice that we had a note here that states that summon minions will die more often. Now, we want the uh, corpses to have sort of an economy. We want to have the uh, sense that mm. the corpses are useful. You're using them to, to bring in more skeletons. And the necromancer uh, pets, you know, as a theme of, of this sort of uh, bone uh, class, they are a little bit more disposable, right? Like if a skeleton dies, you just hop out another one from, uh, from a nearby corpse. Um, so we want them to be and you um, can create you know, corpses, dying right? and getting or resummoned. Like we want to make sure that there are plenty of corpses so you're not going into a boss and running out of, you're like, oh, I don't have any pets and I'm a pet builder. We certainly want to make sure that you have pets available, but we want them to be kind of coming back from time to time. So hmm. we, uh, we increase the damage that they take a bit, but we also, uh, you know, I was talking about mean. areas where bosses are doing too much damage to melee. We also took a look at cases where uh, there were abilities that felt unfair for pets um, where there's just like a huge damage in a huge area, and maybe it's no problem for a player to get out of it, but 
trying to uh, micromanage your pets to get micromanage out of this. an army of skeletons <laughs> around. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Not, yeah, that's that's not a fun gameplay that we're trying to, to capture specifically with the next. Or maybe class. so we, we modify those the damage that those kinds of uh, a, yeah. a powers do to pets. Uh, both necromancer and druid. Okay, so the split. Yeah, we do want to make sure that the engine dominions to some degree is is part of the mastery of playing a necromancer. And that, like, you know, when, when skeletons go down, you need to accommodate that and make sure that you have corpses that you've been generating or keeping on hold for some of these situations. Uh, we we feel that that is definitely part of the fantasy of the necromancer class is, is needing to resummon, to your point, these kind of disposable soldiers that are uh, they're supposed to be helping you. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that that continues. Drew has the more primitive. Where, like an army necro can't go fight bosses. That's obviously not what we're trying to build with any of these changes, of course. Uh, we just want to make sure that the uh, the, the necro doesn't doesn't get a chance to engage with those parts of the mechanics. Now another, and oh. I, I did get to play the uh, the summoner necro, and I was summoning my minions regularly, so it was something that was a continuous part of the gameplay. But I never found myself in a position where oh, I'm out of minions, I'm out of corpses. So the corpse generation rate was it felt good. I'll admit that passive minions is not my favorite play style. I would love the ability to direct them, but for what you intended to accomplish, I thought you did. Yeah, so you know, one of the other areas of feedback, we have a note here that says, uh, that, that might be a little bit confusing. It says, we reviewed the class skills to confirm that um, there were good options to get out of control impairing effects. Uh, in many cases, oh, yeah. what we mean is unstoppable, which is the effect in Diablo 4 that clears all uh, uh, control impairing effects. So you gave more stuff unstoppable. Uh, and makes you immune to them for the duration of that effect. Um, so the, the classes are designed so that every class has, uh, is intended to have access to a good uh, set of options to, to clear crowd control so that there is an, an interaction here between, oh, you know, monsters are doing crowd control and I have options to remove it, but I need to think about those options. Um, and we saw feedback during the beta that at early levels, some classes uh, felt like they didn't have enough options there. Um, Riker, in, in your play um, at the higher levels, did you feel like that was uh, still an issue? Uh, I don't remember it being an issue at, at the high levels of play, no. Uh, going back to my, my favorites, Barbarian now is my second favorite after being my fourth. Uh, again, yeah, the, the, the melee play style, I felt gelled really well with a, with a high level Barbarian. It all came together. I didn't feel I was being punished for being in melee. I didn't feel constantly crowd controlled or, or an inability to uh, mm. gap close. You know, he had his uh, the spears to bring enemies to me, mm -hmm. uh, the lunging attack to, to close the gaps, and uh, a good toolkit to deal with everything. So uh, the last thing I want to note on classes, of course, is that there are a few other changes beyond what you're seeing here. Um, I think you know yeah. uh, some people called out uh, hydro changes. You know, there, we made a lot of uh, small changes to. Um, uh, two classes. Uh, there are also some cases like uh, damage. <laughs> legendary powers. Uh, we updated legendary power effectiveness, which is sort of vague, um, but it's really just that there are a bunch of uh, small details and, you know, we're sort of uh, tweaking them. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, dungeons, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we got a lot of feedback from players that uh, there was a lot of oh, running yeah. back in dungeon. Um, and there were, uh, a there were really two ways that we wanted to tackle this. Um, first off, of course, uh, if we have a situation where you're running back, um, we have a, a system that causes uh, monsters to ambush you uh, to make sure that it's not just running through an empty space. Um, so we added more ambushes. Um, but Ambushing. secondly, and this is really the more uh, effective aspect of it, um, we changed the layouts of dungeons and where objectives uh, were located in the dungeons. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, see. Um, look, look at this. Graphic <laughs> design is our passion. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, <laughs> I wish that I made this this graphic because it's uh I it's did so laugh really hard when I saw it the first time. <laughs> so I love it so much. Um, but I did not make it. Uh, but uh, I think this is a great example. So this is an, uh, one of the dungeons that players called out in beta, Horror Frost and I, right? As one, one that day, had one a lot day. of run back. Um, and uh, one of the reasons that you can see here uh, that it has so much run back is that the objectives are laid out in a way that you have to run down a long, narrow hallway to get to one, and then you have to run back. It's, it's a dead end, and then you have mm -hmm. to run back down that narrow hallway. Picking that so in. we changed the layout of Horfrost Demise uh, like this. Right. Mm. So you can see that the, uh, the objectives, uh, which are those oh. um, yeah, diamond, so it's connecting. Uh, icons there on your screen, mm -hmm. Um, are along the main path of the dungeon, and 
remember now, in this case, the player has explored all of the dungeon and you can see all of the map. Yeah. But when you're playing through the dungeon, you don't have, the map is, is fog, you, don't, right. you haven't explored it yet. Mm -hmm. um, but it's set up in such a so way that as you're exploring objective the there. Dungeon, um, you're going to naturally encounter those objectives along your way. And so you're not going down and then having to backtrack a long way. Yeah, in, in our objective view, this was going to lead to smiles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This yes. is a good. This is good. <laughs> but no, it's important. Like we, we want to make sure that it, as you're progressing the space, you are naturally coming across these objectives in a, a simpler way, as opposed to you need to like kind of like wander and kind of like backtrack a lot more as part of that. Yeah, and in fact, we we identified um, a one? number of dungeons that w that got this feedback uh, in beta, and we also, you know, we were talking about uh, nightmare dungeons. We also want to make sure that nightmare dungeons. Um, have this, we address this for Nightmare Dungeons as well because it's a key replayability system as we were just talking about earlier. So what is uh, it this now? This is another example, uh, Cordragon, Cordragon Barracks. Uh, it's another dungeon that uh, we saw a lot of uh, feedback and screenshots from beta um, where you can see that the uh, objectives are set up such that clearly you're going to have to run It'll back. It'll be like this, all the probably way, go uh, to the left the side and then it'll just go way. to the right you're side. Spiral around, you have to go out. And then go uh, in, go, it'll be like a snail spirals, maybe. Uh, and you can end uh -huh. up um, getting confused and running running back. Because mm -hmm. um, the other thing that happens here is that if you've uh, run to an objective and the next thing that you have is back along a path that you know about already, um, then why wouldn't you just run back along that path that's empty of monsters? That's, it's not fun. It's more fun to kill monsters, but it's more efficient than exploring some, way, uh, some unknown that might or might not lead back to it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a key part of these layout changes as well. And if you take a look at the next mm. shot here, you can see how we rearranged the objectives uh, in Cordragon to, to ameliorate this. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, these aren't the only changes we right. made uh, either. You know, there's some other things we did to actually just to straight up just regular objectives. Mm -hmm. So there's things like, uh, there are some dungeons where the players are asked to kill all the monsters inside the dungeon space. And in those situations, we've made it so like, once the players reach a certain threshold of monsters they've killed, rather than yeah. saying like, you know, there are potentially as many as 50 zombies in this cave. You know, after the player has killed, you know, uh, 49 times. zombies, they might still be normally looking around in the last corner to where a zombie got like, is kind of like hiding in a closet someplace, right? In this situation, uh, instead, once you reach a certain threshold of zombies that you've killed, now they actually yep. begin chasing you down. They start looking for you in that situation, such that you don't need to go crawl through the entire space and explore every uh, inch of unexplored uh, area in that dungeon just to find the zombies. Some of them are going to come after you in those situations, which is a great change to make it a little bit easier to engage with those things. Um, and then there's another one. like there's uh, We have features where, or dungeon objectives, where the player is asked to go and collect like anima, which are just these objects. They're like these, yeah. uh, these motes of energy that drop on the ground when you kill certain kinds of monsters. Sometimes you need to go and grab a whole bunch of these things and then bring them back to uh, another area to deposit them. It could sometimes open the door, might summon a boss, all kinds of things that we do with this. Uh, but in these situations now, when players are collecting this, uh, this animal when they're running around, the, uh, running around the dungeon trying to find all, uh, all these creatures and do these things, you're going to also gain uh, various buffs by picking these up. You're going to gain some resource back for your class. You can get some other things. It's, uh, it's actually really great. When you actually deposit these things, you're going to get a health potion. So there's lots of things we're trying to do to make sure that those experiences like help like uh, speed you up and feel great to, uh, to engage with while you're also going through a lot of the layout changes that Joe just talked about. Yeah, there, so, you know, I, I, I'm glad you pointed out uh, kill all monsters. Because, hmm. um, you know, players rightly identified a couple of key problems. Like, first off, uh, with kill all monsters, uh, of course, if you're having to go and hunt down one of those monsters, that's effectively backtracking, right? You're running through an empty yeah. space. And the other aspect of it is that the uh, sort of the intensity curve of, like, the excitement in the dungeon is is going down. Like you're running, backtracking through a bunch of empty space, mm -hmm. and then when you get there, it's not going to be an exciting moment. Yeah. There's going to be four done, four monsters hiding in the corner, yeah. and you're going to kill them, and it's going to feel sort of like, well, I guess, I guess that was a requirement it's, that I it's had to one off. spider. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. it's uh, um, it's it's almost similar to like Den of Evil, Diablo two feel and so yeah. forth. But now them being able to seek you out means less backtracking, less hunting in corners mm -hmm. for that one fall in or wherever. They well, yeah, are. and and I the other thing I like about it is that it increases hmm. the intensity at the end of the dungeon, right? Because yep. you have the the monsters, at, you're you're still clearing the last monsters, and now you have monsters running at you. Um, <laughs> but uh, what was your experience with these changes? Yeah, so. This was probably my number one complaint about the beta was was the backtracking. Was I'd often in a dungeon at some point reach a point where I'm like, okay, 
I have to run back or I have to go look for a monster. And with these changes, I don't think I ever had one of those moments, or at least I'm not going to say there was zero backtracking, but there wasn't enough that it would have come up as an issue that I would have complained about. I know some people, you know, say, oh, suck it up. Backtracking has always been part of Diablo. It's part of the game. Um, but, like, the changes made hasn't made the experience linear. It's not like, oh, well, now we just have one quarter to go down. Uh, as you were saying, like, now there's, if you do go on a side path, there could be uh, things to Other run things. into. But just overall, everything from an experience standpoint just flows a lot better. Um, I know with beta learnings and, and, and everything that we, we took in from the, the community and we posted on the blog, we actually had um, a big question in regards to dungeons and, and reset dun yes. re resetting dungeons oh. and, and how that actually works. And I, I do want to take some time um, for, for you guys to be able to clarify a little bit because there's tons of questions. And yes. then we tried to clarify, and I think we made it worse. <laughs> so, so we're going to... Let's re-clarify the clarification. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes, so the reset dungeon button, right? <clears throat> um, so we added this button um, er earlier in development when there wasn't a, an easy way for dungeons to reset naturally. Um, and uh, in fact, the way we added it led to some uh, undesirable secondary effects <clears throat> um, because uh, it was instant. It didn't care if you were inside the dungeon. Uh, it doesn't care if the dungeon is uh, partially completed. Uh, if you're a hardcore character and you're in danger, you can just press it and press it out. Press <laughs> yep. out, you're yep. good. Um, and uh, since since the since we initially added this uh, button, the amount of time for dungeons to reset organically, um, we've been working with our online team and we've been making changes to you mm. know uh, over the course of development, like how tap portal works, how dungeon reset works, um, and so the way that it works today. If you are outside the dungeon, uh, and if, if everyone from your party is outside the dungeon, so if you're alone, just you, uh, and there are no town portals open in the dungeon, um, then the dungeon will naturally reset over a period of about 60 seconds, about 30 seconds of matchmaking and 60, 30 seconds no of No portal? Uh, or if it's partially completed, like maybe you got halfway through and you're like, you know what, I have to do something else, so I'm going to go you know, kill a world boss, or you know, I, I want to do something else now. Um, then it'll, it'll take a little bit longer to reset. It takes about 150 seconds, but it'll still reset naturally pretty quickly. Okay. And the other case uh, here is so they made everything naturally. You've got maybe maybe you're doing the dungeon, and there's some particular objective in the dungeon or side quest in the dungeon, and someone, uh, one of your friends, joins, and they want to do that side quest too, right? But maybe you've already completed it in this dungeon, um, so um, you can also. Uh, hop out of the dungeon, which you can use through the leave dungeon button right in the UI as well. Uh, it does have a short cast time, so uh, <laughs> not not as quick. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it's it's quite a fit. It's right through the UI. You can do it from anywhere, um, and uh, you know, uh, invite the other person to the party. See your friend at the party. Make them leader. Hop in. You'll get a fresh dungeon as well. Yeah. So hopefully that clarifies. You can still reset. You like resetting dungeons is still a thing. Uh, in D4, it's just we removed the button essentially, so uh, you would just have to wait a little bit longer for the dungeons it's themselves to, to reset. And I, I did want to go over two um, un uh, or like right. or two specific changes that are we we also uh, obtained through beta that we didn't actually report on the blog. One you actually tweeted about, which was um, uh, about uh, ultra again? wide screens. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And being the able to control cast. Uh, distance and so forth, uh, and with specific abilities and whatnot. So uh, people who are using ultra wide or mega ultra wide screens, like wouldn't be able to uh, essentially cast to the furthest corner of their their screen uh, and be able to use abilities in that type of way. Um, and then one other thing that we did notice during beta, uh, which was uh, world boss encounters and how players would actually complete a world boss encounter. And yeah. Then go back to town and then find another way of being able to, in that same window, go through another world boss encounter to, right. to obtain uh, multiple opportunities of, of, of grabbing loot, which is something that we also uh, did address uh, through the, uh, the beta learnings that we, we received from players. So That's true. Now, I'll point out that um, the first uh, time you kill a world boss in a week, you are going to get more loot than you'll get on subsequent times. So there's additional incentive to like there's, there's less incentive to try to like find a way to like kill the same world boss ten times, but yep. you certainly will get some rewards from yeah. it. Yeah, 
exactly. Yeah, so it's it's not the exact rewards or, uh, or a clone of the rewards that you got from the first code in the cells. Um, great. Uh, I know we, we ended up learning... Wait, uh, they, they just change it so then you get less reward, right? ...in regards to the beta. Uh, obviously, you guys got to hear a little bit did they, about... Did they fix uh, the part the, where... Uh, end game uh, systems within Diablo 4. Um, we do have a cool... Oh, is this? it time for a surprise? Is it time for a surprise? It is time for a surprise. Oh, um, oh. surprise it, time. If, if, if you've been uh, hiding on the internet and have not seen Rod Ferguson make very, very uh, uh, nonchalant tweets about this, oh. you, um, this is the and more. This is the and more oh. of the, the actual... Um, uh, uh, broadcast, I would say. Oh. Uh, so uh, happy to announce that um, we've been hearing a lot of feedback from players about wanting to uh, experience more Diablo 4 and, and check it out, you know, uh, before the, the, the game's release in oh, June. Man. And so on May 12th through May 14th, we are going to be hosting Holy a Server Slam event uh, where all players within Diablo 4 or who want to play Diablo 4 can jump in and actually uh, check out the game again. Uh, this is a really important weekend for the team and the dev team here because we need as many people uh, to really log in, check out Diablo 4 and play through the game uh, uh, because we need to test out our servers some more uh, before we actually launch. Um, Joe, I know you, you, you have a lot of uh, 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 want and need and emphasis towards yeah. this specific weekend, so be curious oh. to hear. Yeah, so first off, you know, uh, all of the changes that we just talked about in this live stream will be in place on the server slam. Yeah, so huge news right there where if you want to check out any of the, the changes that we made from beta, you will be able to actually check them out uh, this that weekend on May 12th or May 14th. That's right. And the other thing I want to point out is that we recently announced that, we went, well, that we've gone gold, that Diablo 4 has gone gold. And uh, that means that uh, and that's we got all of those changes from the betas in. We did uh, tons of... Um, you know, server, we learned to play game. Stuff, uh, in terms of our servers, in terms of server configuration, um, making sure that we were fixing bugs. We deployed hot fixes during those two weekends. Um, and, and so we were able to really uh, improve our confidence for, you know, for launch through that. And that's why... Uh, I didn't take any PTO or anything, but, you know... We're so confident in announcing that we I mean, just, it's just now, still going to get wiped. This weekend is to slam those servers, right? Right really make sure that everything is exactly perfect for launch because that's really what's important to us, right? We want players to have a good experience on day one when the game launches. And, you know, uh, so come slam our servers. Now, of course, this is very helpful for us because uh, and it's helpful if you want to play on day one. It's, course, helpful, it's helpful for helpful the Diablo 4 community but, to come help us <laughs> slam our servers, but... <laughs> that's, not all your, that's not the only reason to do it. Um, when you participate in the Diablo 4 Server Slam, you're going to have another chance uh, to earn the oh, rewards uh, mm. from the first two beta weekends. So if you didn't get a chance to play, uh, oh, it's a new trophy. Traveling or for any other reason, um, you have another chance to get your Beta Wolf pack. Cosmetic, Wait, I don't, I don't remember uh, this trophy and thing. The two, uh, titles. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, um, we've. You know, for this server slam weekend, we're set, we've set the level cap to level 20. Mm -hmm. We've um, adjusted the legendary drop rates to be consistent with what you'll see on live, uh, rather than the inflated drop rates that we had in the first two beta weekends, oh. uh, which were there to make sure that we got plenty of testing on our legendary powers. Mm -hmm. No and, inflated uh, on top legendaries. Of that, um, you're going to have uh, 48 hours in the, to, to slam these servers, right? Now, during this time, a Shava is going to spawn starting about 24 hours after the servers uh, go up, and then every three hours after that. So you're going to have, uh, I think it's oh. nine opportunities to fight a Shava. Now, if you get to level 20 and you kill a Shava while you are level 20, so max level in this test, in this period of time... What level is it, though? 20. It's 20. So you got to be level 20? Yeah. To get don't, the... don't show up in the Shava at level 5 and think and you're going to get this. Uh, yeah, expect you'll get the, the, right. the reward. But yeah. what you're going to get is this Cry of a Shava Mount Trophy, which is uh, exclusive to this uh, Service Slam weekend. You can see it here on, uh, on your screens. Yeah, the trophy there and the, that horse's hip on the saddle there. Very nice. Oh, wow, it's really... That's bigger than I thought it was going to yeah, be. Yeah. That's you, awesome. We basically oh cut a horn... Part of a Shava's horn yeah. off, and you know, you know, 
made it, added some gilding and, and some, some nice metal work there. Um, and of course, uh, mount trophies in Diablo are uh, cosmetic customizations that you can add to your mount along with mount armor. Um, so this is a, a trophy that you can mount. It mounts, some trophies mount on the saddle. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm pointing to my shoulder. <laughs> This is where the shadows go, apparently. Yeah. Um, or so I'm like typing on, through on this. On the horse's flank, like you see here uh, yeah. with this trophy. Yeah, so uh, again, like all rewards from the original uh, first two weekends of the beta, including the two titles and the beta wolf pack will be available, as well as the uh, Cry of Ashava mount trophy. Um, and for the mount trophy, you have to be level 20 and kill Ashava. All classes will be available. Um, and you'll be able to explore Fractured Peaks again uh, from the uh, two beta weekends that we had beforehand. And of course, Ashava will be spawning much more often in this uh, server slam yeah, legendary rates for players to actually jump in and legendary. obtain the rewards and really help us out, help out the team, uh, and make sure that we have a smooth launch for Diablo 4 come June. So uh, huge news and, uh, for all of this. And we will have a blog that will be going either live right now or live immediately after the broadcast uh, for players to actually read about all this information. Damn, I got to read will be this. available on uh, Diablo4.com. So make sure to uh, check out the blog, get all your information there, and uh, jump in on our, our Server Slam weekend, March the 12th, blog March 14th. All up right now? It's an opportunity to, to play Diablo 4 before the launch. Oh, it is. Really great. Uh, and you can test all the, the new beta changes, which is really cool. And one other thing that I do want to know for at least PC players uh, who are jumping into the Server Slam weekend, um, the 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 team here has done some massive Damn, work. Damn, I take another PTO on May 12th? <laughs> first two uh, uh, beta weekends. Um, uh, DLSS3 uh, for, uh, for NVIDIA cards will also be available uh, for uh, people to try out in uh, the Server Slam. I have weekends, to read this later. Uh, or Server Slam weekend. Weekend. <laughs> Sorry, there's only one. I don't want to, I don't want to like set expectations or anything. Um, but uh, there's more graphic options and optimizations and so forth for PC players to check out. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Oh. Looking forward to everyone uh, really hitting the servers and, and really helping out with the game. Um, we do we want to jump into Q&A because we always end with Q&A. Um, Riker actually uh, has a bunch of questions that he was asking his own community. Uh, that oh, level 20 this time, not 25. As well. And then we're also going to be grabbing some questions here from Chad and so forth. Um, one question that we have been seeing uh, that has like come up within the community beforehand, and we'll start off with this one, uh, which is like, how long will it take us to get through the battle pass? It's a question that a lot of people in the community have been talking about over the last. That was like eighty hours, half. right? I know that we wanted to talk about it a little bit more here. Yeah, I think that there's a. So I've talked a little bit about this in the past, uh, but I, I think one thing I really want to emphasize is that. When Whenever we, they're going to change the, for, the uh, for for Diablo Four, uh, the mechanics of the or we're not. Our, 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 our seasonal uh, players. Uh, we want to make sure that the players who are going to the battle pass, they're going to have a lot of content to consume, like outside of the battle pass. They'll, they're in all likely going to finish everything in the battle pass before they finish all of the content within a season, season to season. You know, so there's there's a ton of things to look forward to. We want to make sure that the battle pass as a result is balanced in such a way that players of all types and all play styles are going to be able to get a chance to actually complete this uh, the, uh, this battle pass over the course of time. Our goal is like if you uh, if you want to start to engage with this, want to make sure that you are compelled to go through all the measures of playing. And just having a good time getting all these rewards. Yeah. Uh, all right. Cool. Uh, Riker, I know you have questions. I want to make sure that you get some questions in. And is so there forth. wait? Is there uh, new end game we'll systems that didn't go over? This. I, it'll make it easier uh, for for these two guys. I mean, for but, you guys, we'll just be doing this. Like, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Just keep 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 doing that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sounds great. Uh, well, so first off, I, something that you were I think touching upon earlier, and correct me if I if I misunderstood, but I I think. On the topic of Nightmare Dungeons, it sounds like every season there's going to be a rotation of 30 dungeons that can be turned into the Nightmare Dungeons. Is that right? So we want to make sure that we've got a subset of the dungeons we have in the overall game. There's over 115 or so like side dungeons for, uh, available in the baseline Diablo 4 experience. We want to mm. take a subset of those each season. The exact number we're working on, it's going to be, we're going to think about that and think about it. But, uh, but a number of those can be rotated every season to make sure that we are highlighting different kinds of objectives, different sorts of layouts, different monster families, di just different experiences. And we also don't want players to feel that they're going to have this uh, world where they have to be thinking about, you know, all 115 different dungeons every season, every time, with regard to this system in particular. So that is the idea. We do want to rotate mm. through these from season to season while we're looking to introduce other ideas. Yeah. Cool. 
Um, it, I got a question here from, uh, I, I'm not going to butcher Twitch names, guys. <laughs> I, I do this every stream. From a Twitch um, user. From a Twitch user in <laughs> chat. Uh, do you have any plans to keep interest for people who don't plan to play in seasons? So we are going to be making on a regular basis part of our live updates. We're not quite ready to talk about like all of our seasonal plans and all of our post-launch plans yet, but I will say this. Uh, that we're going to be having a lot of like really rich and interesting content updates for our, our seasonal players, but we're still be making balance changes and adding new, uh, adding like new like legendary items and like unique items and things of that nature for players who are playing in the Eternal Realm, the place where uh, you will never have to worry about like a character reset or do any of those things. Uh, there will always be new infusions of some game content at that level uh, to players going in that space. Cool. But for the richest experience uh, in the post-launch environment, I would highly recommend checking out Seasons because we're doing some really They made really it sound cool like stuff. level 20 is the max level, right. huh? Um, so one thing that I noticed in the December press beta to the public beta was that changes were made to the skill tree. There were like new passive skills, there were new paths made amongst yeah. the passive nodes. So okay. I'm wondering, was the skill tree designed in such a way that... Only 20 this time. ...you can, over the course of Seasons or expansions, add new passive or active skills? Yes. So the skill tree really that we have for Diablo 4 at launch really is just the beginning for these classes. We are going to be looking for new opportunities to create uh, more play styles within each of the classes, we'll be adding new passives, potentially new skills in the future. Uh, these are things that we would like to do. It is likely that the, the, uh, these kinds of updates, particularly of like new passives, like new nodes, new things in the skill tree, are more likely to happen as part of our like a like our future large, larger like expansion size updates rather than things that might be happening as part of the seasons. We have lots of interesting customization options we're going to be adding as part of Seasons, uh, but they might not touch the skill tree specifically. Okay. Okay. Um, we've been seeing this question a lot. I've been seeing it in chat as well, and there's, I, I think, some confusion in regards to Alters Lilith, mm. how those will work in between uh, Seasons, and, or, you know, it, will those reset? Like, how does that specifically work? Sure. Uh, so Alters Lilith are one of the, uh, the features that players can go and uh, collect, basically, in the, uh, the overworld that we're going to contribute to their, their renown uh, total within each of the zones. Well, and give permanent par character power as well. Well, I'm going to get there. Okay. So there's two purposes, really, that the Alters Lilith have. They have this, uh, this, this larger collectible feature where you want to kind of go get all of them uh, for, the, uh, for, the, um, for the stat points that you just called out. Yeah. And then they also provide uh, the renown. So renown is reset on a seasonal basis. So when you start a new character, uh, your renown score goes back down to zero. You'll have to go and finish side dungeons, go do side quests, uh, go do uh, go find all sorts of go do these things in order to kind of get that uh, that renown back up to unlock all of those benefits. Now you don't need to go do all of that content in the zone to to max out your renown bar. There's actually way more activities that grant renown than you actually need to complete in order to finish yeah, going through and yeah. filling up the, okay. uh, all of the renown and getting all five tiers of the rewards. Uh, when it comes to the stat gain, so basically to your point that you're just speaking about, yeah, all those little also have another purpose. And that when you find one, they give you a stat boost that's supposed to apply to your character and all characters in that realm. Uh, the way that that's going to work is that once you've collected that stat boost from an, a specific altar of Lilith, uh, that stat effect is going to propagate out to other characters of that game type. So basically, hardcore is going to have its own uh, progression for this, where if, like, if you were playing a hardcore character on, at launch and you go and you do all these things, those stat, uh, those stat boosts you collect will propagate to your hardcore characters you would make in the seasonal realm. And the same is true for mm, players who are playing okay. in the, uh, the, the normal realm and playing in the normal game mode. Uh, the, all the, uh, the stat boosts they're unlocking via the Altars of Lilith will also unlock for their seasonal characters in the future. Such that players aren't don't need to go and collect every Altar of Lilith with every new season. Right. But you do want to get some of them grant experience. And they do give you uh, some uh, bonus towards your uh, boost towards your renown. But there's not the sense that you need to go and like, do every single one of them every single time. We want that to be a really fun experience for players. Uh, to engage with them, particularly while they're exploring Sanctuary for their first, first couple times at most, you know, and, and have that uh, have that bit of fun. Otherwise, players can choose to engage with them or ignore them as they go into their seasonal playthroughs in the future. Right. So, characters, uh, you will if you unlock a permanent stat boost in season one, that will persist into season two. That's correct. All right. Uh, with regards to item farming, we touched upon how Helltide, you can target farm specific slots. Is there any other kind of item types where either you can only get this item in this zone, this location, or is there some greater propensity for some items to drop off certain monsters, anything like that? So we have a number of different uh, creatures in the game that have a chance to drop particular things. Uh, world bosses, for example, have a, a really, really good chance to drop Scattered Prism, which is the crafting material you need in order to add sockets to items in the game. Uh, and then there are certain content types that have the, uh, the chance to... Uh, to Every three hours. Like Fiend Bros, for example, really only shows up in Helltide areas. 
And the only way to level, uh, raise the level of your glyph is by going through and doing nightmare dungeons. When it comes to item farming, uh, we also, and I've talked a little bit about this in the past, but I think it's a, uh, it's good to remind people, and also just to continue talking about it, right? Cause I do it again. <laughs> and that is that when you're fighting creatures of a, a certain monster family, like zombies or skeletons for their respective families, uh, those monsters have a higher chance to drop certain kinds of items. It's actually a bonus chance to drop certain item types kind of happening in the background. So it's not like if an item, like for example, uh, bonus, huh? Okay. skeletons have a high chance, have a chance rather, not high chance, they have a chance to drop crossbows irrespective of your class. So you play a barbarian, which can't use crossbows, it's one of its, its weapon types, and you can be killing all these skeletons and you might just get a, a crossbow drop as a result of that. That's tradable with rogues, you know, there's other things you can do with that, but that's, that's not taking a, a role from the skeleton. It could drop everything else in addition to that crossbow. It's like an extra bonus thing that, uh, that skeletons can drop. Every monster family has a few different things they drop this way. So as players are going through the experience, and particularly while they're leveling mm, up in the campaign, bonus, huh? they'll occasionally start seeing like, oh, I'm, I'm getting like a lot of like rings from this, or I'm getting a lot of boots from this, or I'm getting a lot, of, and they'll realize that over time, uh, uh, they'll realize over the course of time that these are being dropped based on the monster families they're, uh, they're engaging with. So as players discover more of this, and they continue to fight more monsters and start mapping some of these things out, they will uncover the right areas or the best areas potentially to farm for certain kinds of things. And that includes like unique items as well. So if you're looking for a unique crossbow, maybe it behooves you to fight, uh, try to fight a lot of skeletons because you know they have a chance to drop crossbows in addition to other things. So these are the sorts of things that like Bonus. as you're diving deeper into like the hunting gameplay, the item hunting Bonus gameplay, chance. these are things to look at. That's not the end. There's a lot more we're going to be doing as the game continues to mature and as we're going into like our post-launch period. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that when the time's right. Very nice. Um, this one is kind of tied to some of the server slam stuff that we just announced, mm -hmm. which is, uh, will there be any additional changes made to the game after the server slam weekend, like what was done during the beta? No. I mean, they went gold. I mean, we announced that the game has gone gold. Uh, the server slam is, you're testing a version of the game that is uh, very close to the launch version of the game. That's that's why it's so effective as a server slam. Um, now, of course, as a live service game, um, we're going to be continuing to take feedback exactly like you saw during the beta, during the during the uh, you know, after the game's launch. launch, and making changes and making improvements based on on data and testing data. Awesome. All right, overlay map versus mini map. Mini map is a little map in the top right corner. Overlay is what we had in the past in D two, where you have this semi transparency of the the large scale map over your actual gameplay. D4 does not have an overlay map. A lot of people are asking for it. What's the, uh, what's the reason for no overlay? Yeah, so when you're playing through a, an action RPG and you're playing through that core loop, you're basically switching between two modes of behavior, right? You're killing monsters or you're navigating. Mm -hmm. And you're switching back and forth between those really quickly. And so it can be helpful to have that be as fast as possible so that you can, can I just kill those monsters, okay, where am I gonna go? Is there an objective to the left or right? right? And so the overlay map is very effective at doing that. Um, in fact, it's so effective that it's up all, that there's no reason to ever close it. Um, and so there are a lot of solutions that we've seen um, different games do in terms of like trying to mitigate um, sort of its effects on combat uh, in terms of uh, fading areas around the player or, or other things like that. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep the, the combat and navigation spaces as clean as possible um, by separating them a little bit more. And so that's why you see the mini map, you see uh, the pin system on the map, um, you see uh, in cer certain cases uh, mm. edge of screen indicators on the mini map. Um, we want to add more of those kinds of things. Um, but ultimately, you know, our goal is to make sure that players um, when they're going back and forth between combat mode and navigation mode, that they have the tools that they need to do it efficiently, and they don't feel like it's a huge um, hassle. So we're going to be continuing to look at this feedback. Um, we, our, 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 uh, for launch, um, you know, you won't have an overlay map. We're trying to make that experience as smooth as possible. Um, but we're going to conti continue to listen to player feedback on this one. All right. Mm. Um, we have a question saying, are all dungeons going to be single floor iterations with halls like traversing, or are we going to get like maybe multi-level dungeons or anything uh, that uh, brings like elevation or depth and so forth into those? You know, it's interesting that uh, one of the things that we did in Diablo 4 um, that's really cool is that um, you don't have to load between dungeon floors. Um, an interesting effect of that is that um, you might not always notice when you're going down a floor into a lower floor. 
there is a, you know, there are staircases and, and there are sort of moments where, where that shows up and there's UI uh, that appears that shows up. Uh, but in many cases, our dungeons do have multiple floors and because it's so seamless, you don't always notice. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, when you think back to Diablo 1 and adventuring down through the cathedral and it's this very uh, deep, uh, deep dungeon, um, our dungeon tech can certainly do that too. And that's um, certainly something that uh, could be a cool option for the future. Awesome. All right, with regards to PVP, is there any kind of instancing to separate out solo players versus groups or are we gonna see like four-man squads ganking lonely players? Yeah, you will see four-man squads ganking lonely <laughs> players. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I want to I wanna make sure I really, I'm really clear about this. Uh, the, the fields of hatred that we have in Diablo 4 are not a place for honor. Uh, they're a place for slaughter. And uh, so if you go into those spaces, you need to be mindful that you are entering a, a chaotic realm of, of danger and threat. That's the fantasy. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, now, players who go into these spaces might also uh, be fortunate to find that there's a number of other players that are trying to uh, peacefully farm up you know, uh, in various resources uh, while they're finding they're not actually be interested in engaging in PvP immediately. You know, that also is a situation you might occasionally find yourself in. Maybe you try, maybe you decide that you want to take advantage of them and you show up and decide you want to go and, and gank those players and take their things. You know, it's, it's it, greed gets the best of us all at some point in time. But I want to make it really clear that there is, there is some, uh, there is some, there are th uh, things in place in terms of how we bucket players by level and things like that mm. to ensure that you're not always be going up against like really, really high level players at very, very low level. No, but in terms of like, I'm walking this space, is there any guarantee that there aren't three people and uh, some more roaming around uh, this area looking to gank lonely people like me? Uh, the answer is there is no mechanic in place to prevent that from occurring. So you need to be mindful of that when you're walking around here. I uh, go in there with friends uh, or, or, or walk in and be prepared to occasionally die. You know, um, especially when you immediately walk into a field of hatred, if you were to immediately get uh, killed by other players, there's actually no real penalty for you in that case. Now, you haven't started to acquire any of the, uh, the, the PP resources in that zone yet anyway. So they have nothing to gain from killing. And you Do you lose their ability? You don't, right? Yeah. yeah. So you know, like PP, you know. yeah, Things to experiment with, but you know, going with the right set of expectations. But there is some pseudo matchmaking to stop like level 100 players ganking level 25 players? That's correct. There is some bucketing in place to make sure that doesn't occur. I would add too that the um, the fields of hatred are fairly large areas. Yes. So um, you're not. There are some some tools to avoid. Uh, you know, uh, the same group of players repeatedly killing you. There are also two two fields of hatred. You can move between fields of hatred, mm -hmm. and there are uh, things like elixirs um, the, uh, that can allow you to be more evasive or um, get away from situations where you feel like you're at a disadvantage. Um, or um, there are also, when you think about um, uh, the field of hatred mechanic, you're get collecting these, uh, uh, these shards of hatred mm -hmm. uh, and you're refining them so that you can turn them in for, for rewards. Um, th the locations that you can do that, there are several locations uh, typically active at a time. So you can sort of do some strategizing about where there might be enemy players and where it might be safe. That's right. When one is, when a uh, an altar is being used to purify those shards of hatred into red dust, you'll actually see a notification on your map to let you know where that's actually occurring. So if you see that there's a lot of activity in the northwestern part of the, uh, the zone, maybe that's a great time to sneak over to the southeastern side and try to uh, quietly and quickly uh, cleanse some shard, uh, some red dust of your own. So mm. once it's cleansed, you can't lose it. You don't drop it. Oh. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I, we have a, a lot of uh, questions related to like seasonal stuff and battle pass stuff. I just want to note that we actually are uh, our next live stream uh -huh, uh, yeah. in uh, in May, in early soon. May, soon, uh, soon, soon, uh, soon TM, will be uh, uh, actually focusing a little bit on our seasonal structure as well as uh, battle pass and so forth. So we're actually going to leave those comments specifically for that. I keep looking down at the monitor and the people in production behind me keep going, Adam, what's wrong with you? That's just me. Um, in regards to other quick hey, questions that we do have. Is there, is, um, what about the uh, end game? I'm gonna is there just lightning that off we don't... a few questions that have been coming up. Uh, one, these are kind of related, I would say, but well, one is a co-op on PC. Uh, have we looked at doing something like that? Uh, and then separately, mouse and keyboard on console. Is that something that we've also looked into? Uh, no couch co-op on PC, no mouse and keyboard on console. 
There you go. <laughs> um, uh, mainly because, I, it, as you guys know, PC, uh, like the, the account structure on Battle.net and, and having two accounts at the same time on one PC is a little difficult. Um, and then on console, re right now it's just uh, controller play. Um, and you know, as we get past launch and so forth, we'll look at more into feedback and everything from that end. I guess last mm -hmm. question from me. Um, with regards to the crafting system, can we expect that to be something that is uh, built up to be more robust over time? with regards to either seasons or, again, expansions? Oh, yes. So uh, Diablo 4 is a game about collecting, killing monsters, collecting loot, uh, screwing around with that loot to do fun things and make it do, uh, uh, get more performance out of it, modifying those things, looking for the right affix. Uh, yeah, we're going to absolutely continue to be like just changing some of the crafting options, modifying them, providing new options that don't exist right now, building upon... You didn't go over any of place. the end game you stuff that... Like Diablo 4 is a live service. didn't system. know. It's, like it's a rich better right. opportunities to continue to like refine change update you know it and went uh, in more and deeply on everything huh? place right now so yeah you'll you'll definitely see more crafting features over the course of time awesome um last few small questions uh people have been asked about ray tracing uh because we mentioned the nvidia oh, dlss still 10 3, minutes left. maybe uh, maybe the trailer uh, on it coming in the, the the service land ray tracing is coming after launch uh it's something that we had talked about earlier um and uh let's see well, this is an interesting question. If you're on your mount, can you actually uh, do like pick up uh, crafting materials and stuff like that uh, while you're on your mount in in, in Overworld? Uh, there are a number of simple uh, actions you can perform when you're on your mount. I believe right now you can pick up herbs when you're on when you're mounted. Yes. Cool. I'm trying to see hmm. if we have the chat's moving incredibly fast. Yeah. A I, lot of people are talking about Wazi. I'm just gonna movement. let right them type it out. We don't have any plans for incorporating that. Is something that we may look into post-launch or whatnot from our end. Um, cool. I think uh, we we got a decent amount of questions in. Talked about this, uh, the uh, the the beta learnings and of course uh, all the uh, information about Endgame. And the server slam. And the server slam. Ashiba server slam. Yeah. Yeah. On uh, you mentioned WASD movement. So no, WASD movement will not be in the game at launch. Um, but uh, in the server slam. Do check out the additional um, control customization options that we added. Yes. Uh, they are referenced on the blog. And we want to continue to... Wait, we're, um, there's supposed to be more that we don't know, right? Uh, ways with to, game. to customize the control scheme in the way that you're thinking of. So something, exactly. something that we're thinking Are we not? <laughs> exactly. Um, so thank you guys again. And thank you, Riker, for, for joining us this week. I know... Uh, I guess there a, isn't a any. <laughs> ...opportunity to play through the game uh, quite a lot. We've, we've just stuck him in a room. Uh, <laughs> he's really just played the game There's still a time 10 this minutes, week. Though. Um, but we really appreciate everyone tuning in uh, for the D Diablo 4 developer update live stream. Uh, again, our next live stream will be sometime in May, uh, early May, and we'll be talking a little bit about our season structure as well as our battle pass. Um, and hmm. a few other things that we did want to call out on in terms of uh, Diablo 3, um, we have season 28 currently going on right now. Yep. Uh, it's an awesome okay. season. Highly recommend checking check it, it out, out. Yeah, check it if out. you if you haven't. Um, and then of course the Diablo Immortal. Uh, they just came out with a big update uh, about a week or two ago uh, that added a new uh, uh, PVP system into the mm. game. Uh, so make sure to check that out if you if you haven't as well. For Diablo 2, we do want to announce one quick thing as well, uh, which is the Diablo 2 Day season four, four um, uh, will act or Diablo 2 season four will actually begin on May 4th. Um, so we did want to get that out so people can plan their calendars because it's always been a, uh, so a fun exciting time 20. within D2R for people to do the ladder race go on, uh, as they kind of uh, get prepped for it, take time off, uh, fall off from work. We'll give you a doctor's note. <laughs> it's perfect. So, um, but yes, thank you guys again for uh, tuning in to the... Just me to actually getting a new endgame system really we didn't know about, but they went the in depth. And thank you again, Riker. Thank you so for, much for joining us. Yeah, yeah. 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 Any parting words from anyone over here? Well, yeah. Yeah, we would like you to slam the server. Yeah, do that. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> you must be level 20. And, uh, uh, you know, we tested... You know, an interesting thing is that we tested the oh, yeah. Ashava fight mm -hmm. at level 20 yep. uh, to make sure that it was doable. Yes. We were pretty sure it was doable, <laughs> but we did want to check and make sure it was doable. Um, they were like, it's, yeah, okay, go it, on. And it's, it is quite challenging. Uh, if you are having a lot of trouble with it, you can always go down to uh, difficulty level. That's true. Uh, difficulty you don't go down to World Tier 1. That's right. Yes. Okay. And Woody Joe, Who's we gonna do that you though? to solo it. Um, totally for sure, for sure. And again, uh, you can pre-purchase Diablo 4 
Uh, we have a QR code up there. Uh, we have a deluxe and ultimate version. I guess maybe I should uh, take May 12th off uh, for the as well. Version that can give you early access up to four days um, before launch. So, yeah. Thank you guys again and really appreciate it. Mm. And we, oh, yes, one other thing. We are going to be uh, raiding into two Diablo partners, both from YouTube and on Twitch. So make sure to stay stay on the channel if you want to check them out. And yeah, thank you guys again. Really I guess that's the it. end, huh? And thank you from all everyone on the Diablo team. See ya. Yeah. All right, I guess, yeah, there's nothing, um, they didn't go over any new system that we didn't know about that was teased, I guess. But they, they added new changes to this, uh, the changes that they got from the beta feedback and this latest build, so, for the server slam. So I'm excited. It'll be the closest thing that we get to. <laughs> Only to level 20, huh? We gotta get this trophy, man. I'll be streaming that. Ah, uh, mage wall. All right, I should probably uh, submit a PTO request. <laughs> Later days. <laughs>